are you doing? I'm great. Great. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. I'm very excited about this new book. I'm also really excited about how many people are uh, picking it up and enjoying it and finding it helpful. It really makes me feel good. Oh, the reviews are wonderful. They're coming in so quickly as well. I've, ne- I've not seen anything like it. It's fantastic. Oh, uh, I have never seen anything like it either, but I've never looked. <laughs> <laughs> I just checked. We're up to 21, which is incredible for a week. It's been out, well, maybe a little bit over a week. I'm up to 21. Yeah, really good. Really good. Um, and uh, they're all five star positive too, which I think is really cool. Okay, enough gloating. But I wanted to thank you very much for you know, talking me into doing this. Uh, because as mo- some people may know, I was a little reluctant to add another chord dictionary. But once we came up with this idea of having the chord melody style approach or, or, or a, a, a um, top note sort of melodic approach, I think that is a new mousetrap in some ways. There just wasn't anything like it. Um, and so what I wanted to do today with your help, because you're going to ask questions and maybe also add in some screenshots and things like that so people can follow this. Um, I want to take a tune called A Foggy Day, and A Foggy Day in London Town, which is appropriate, I think, and uh, I want to go through the the tune and talk about how I might put together a simple arrangement. This is one of the very first tunes I learned how to play a solo guitar piece on, and I think it's a good one for everybody to try and learn, even though it's not a real, you know, uh, standout popular tune or anything. It's got a lot of really nice things about it. So... I think it's going to be easy enough there and and we could talk about how to use the book to get some um some make some progress with a solo guitar version of this tune okay so how about i just play a little bit of it i'll play the first um 16 bars basically the tune has a 16 bar front end then another 16 bars uh and and two extra bars to end it but i'll just do we'll just talk about the first 16. First, I'll just play it. Okay, and that's just something like I might play it if I was playing uh, a little background music somewhere in a situation or, or even in a concert. So now, the page that I'm looking at, which you'll see just as we're talking about it, what I did is I took a fake book page which has the melody and some basic changes which i don't hate (laughs) sometimes i don't like the basic changes that are in the books but these are okay they're not everything you'd ever want but they're good enough Um, and i wrote underneath each melody note the interval relationship of that note to the chord of the moment and that will be the key to being able to use the book so in the book uh, the chords are arranged by the top note or what i'm calling the melody note and um, there are three choices usually the melody note on the third string the melody note on the second string and the melody note on the highest string Uh, there are possible situations where you might bring the melody note down to the fourth string as well that's okay to do and it gets done quite frequently but we had to make some choices about how to organize the book then in the book, in the PDF version, in the searchable version, there's a code. Uh, uh, Luke, could you talk about the code just as, for a second to find these chords? So the book deals with most chord types. So we've got major, minor, minor seven flat five, dominant, altered, and diminished. And the code basically takes a little shorthand code for whichever one of those chord types you want. So say you want major, you'll type M-A-J, And then the next thing you'll do is you'll type the melody note you want. Um, So if it's a major chord with the third on top, you'll write M-A-J, three, and then you write the string you want. So if it's on the high E, the first string, it's one. So okay, okay. Major, three, one. (laughs) 
And and remember, the book is all A rooted chords, so you're going to have to do a little moving around on the conveyor belt as well. So you might find that you're looking up. The only reason we used A instead of any other letter or no letter at all is to make it a little more user friendly. I mean, we could have written this book with no chord letter name. And then you'd have to, and then then we would have to indicate which note in the chord was the root or where the root was, even if there isn't one being played. That seemed a little more complicated. So we just made everything um, have an A root. So for this song, a Foggy Day, the first measure is F major seven. So that would be M A J. Then the 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 note is the fifth. So then you'd write a five and then whatever string you want to put it on. Well, we have two choices in this particular scenario because it's a low fifth or here. So you could write M-A-J-5-3 or M-A-J-5-2. And then when you get to those pages, you will see a variety of voicings that have that note on top on that string and then some colorful things underneath it. So for instance, I could write a simple or play a simple F major chord to play those notes. I could also maybe play something with a nine in it. I could play something with a different bass note. All these various choices, and they, and they will all be within, you know, a little spot in the book where you can see all of those possible chords. And then if you go to the second string melody, we have that standard F major seven. F major six, and now there's incorporating an open string here, which wouldn't appear in the book because it's at the, it would be at the fifth fret. But everybody's smart enough to do that. We can make we can put an open string where we need to. Uh, there's a F six nine. So there's a lot more color over here because we've got a lower bass note. So let's start here. I just played an F triad with the fifth on top. Then the next chord is A minor seven flat five and it has a flat five in the melody. So we're gonna play this standard one here. So then you'd say A, if you're searching for it, no, what are you doing? You you would say minor seven flat five, right? Is that what you, the code would yes, be? Yes, it would be M seven flat five is the code M7 for that. M seven flat five, and then uh, the flat five in the melody, so you'd write flat five, and then you'd write second string. If you're searching, you could search for the for it on the third string. You could search for it on the top string, and you might not succeed in getting it in the right range. But you can always move these things around on the conveyor belt. So chances are you'll be uh, able to find that. And then again, around that uh, voicing, there will be some color, right? So maybe we want a natural nine in that flat five. We want some, you know, right off the bat, we want to say. You know, it's foggy in London, right, with that chord. But maybe you don't want it. Maybe you just want the simplest thing. And then the next chord is D7 with a flat 9. You'll find that one in the altered section. In fact, it's just a continuation of the melody. And then we continue. There's G minor 7 with the 5th in the bass. I'm sorry, with the 5th in the melody. Regular old G minor chord will work. You could play this one. Maybe you could play this one, which I love. Right? But we want to have that note in the melody. Okay, you can also move things around. There's no, there's no uh, hesitation to. Shouldn't be any hesitation to color these things in beautiful ways. Um, another thing about the book that I think is very important is underneath every chord voicing is the interval array that's for that chord. Now this does a couple of things. It tells you what the chord contains. It also tells you if you want to move lines around while you're sustaining a melody and you want to find the nine, well, it may not be in the original voicing, but you can see where it is if you just do a little bit of observation. Okay. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So that's how uh, we would get through um, the first four bars of this thing. And then the last one is a C7 with a 13 on top. Certainly in the fake book, they could have called that C13, but typically they don't call it C13. They just call it C7, and then it's up to you to put the melody in there, right? Because the book wasn't written just for guitar players, right? Okay, so now we can say this. Here's what it would sound like. Now 
maybe I want to change the bass note. Now, the, the book doesn't have this type of information in any great detail, but if you go to the plurality section, you might discover that C7 and E minor 7 flat 5 are the virtually the same type of sound. C7 and a chord built from its third, E minor 7 flat 5 equals E9. Well, this melody note is here. So we just put that melody note, it's in the book, <laughs> E minor 7 flat 5 with the 11th in the melody. We could put it here too. And that takes away the, well, they all take away the third, but that's not as important because it's a C7 in its heart. <laughs> So if you want to have more movement, even if the melody isn't moving, you can use the book for that way too. It's not exactly organized by bottom note or movement in the bass, but if you look at a page, you're going to see, okay, there's a bunch of chords with the root in the bass. Oh, look, there's a bunch more chords with the same melody note with the third in the bass right down the road a little bit, etc. cetera. Yeah, well, okay. One thing we have done is we've been very meticulous about notating every slash chord so it's really easy to spot that's right. versions and look for it um amongst the chords right so between the the inversions that live on the same page and the pluralities which you can study in the very brief section but maybe we'll have a whole nother book about pluralities later but um this this is part of the art of what we're trying to do is we want to get you know interesting bass movement and a clear beautifully stated melody with and something beautiful going on in between those two things. Um, so let's go on. Uh, the next phrase in the song goes. So the one chord with the major seventh on top, and it's up high. So I have a couple of choices here. I can play this little guy here, or I can play a full F major chord. Well, I like that one because it gives me the nine in there. So on the page that says major seven with the with the major seventh in the melody, this chord will appear. All right, and maybe this one will appear, and maybe even this one will appear. All right, I like that one. Anytime there's a nine rubbing against the one or something like that or against the three, I'm a happy camper, you know. Oh, that's good. We're gonna keep that one. Okay, and then. Uh, a simple C minor 7 with a C on top. That's the easiest way to do it if you're playing finger style, which I highly recommend. But you could put a 9 and maybe even a 7th in there. And then da 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 da. B flat with a 7th on top. And then a B flat minor with a 5th on top. G9 with the 9 on top, and then the 5th on top of the 2 and the 5. Okay, so now you get a glimpse into not only how to use the book, but how my brain works when I'm trying to work out a tune, or even if I'm playing it on the spot. So, to be honest with you, if I look at a fake book, I see the name of the note, perhaps, but I also immediately give that thing a number. So I'm, I'm looking at the, the sheet, sight reading a tune, trying to make a solo guitar arrangement, which I'll pretend to do now. Five, flat five, flat nine, five, 13, one, flat five, oh, there it is, five. I'm just saying those, just recognizing those intervals as I'm playing the tune because I have my chordal vocabulary organized by interval number rather than note name. Okay, and the more you work with the book and the more you play around with the conveyor belt, you will get better at that. There's a wonderful chart at the very beginning of the book about how to know what note that you're, what, what melody note that you might be playing, how it relates to the chord of the moment. And so check that out because that'll help you. And then once you work with this conveyor belt and do a lot of moving chords around to fit the key that you want it to be in, you'll get more and more well-versed in this numbering system, which is really handy. Another reason the numbering system is really handy is, let's say I've, I've got a, a solo arrangement of a foggy day and I play it so nicely.
right? And then somebody approaches me or I feel like doing it myself. I want to sing the song. But I don't sing it in that key. Or the singer that I'm meeting or the other instrumentalist doesn't know it in that key or can't play it in that key. Well, if I know the numbers, one, this is the number of the, of the chord itself in relationship to the rest of the chord. So one, three minor, six dominant, two, five, and one, six with a minor seven flat five, and then two dominant, then two minor and five, right? So say somebody wants to play that in A flat. Oh my God, A flat, I can't play that in A flat. Well, if you know the numbers, and then see. What is that? That's what did, what did I say? Six. There it is. Two dominant five. So if I know the numbers, I can I don't have to worry about getting all hung up on alphabet soup. Oh, what's the sixth of A flat? I just go boom, six lives in the same place all the time. So the nice thing about thinking about numbers is that numbers always live in the same relationship to each other. The conveyor belt likes the numbers. <laughs> the conveyor belt doesn't like the, the, the letters. Anyway, so that's a little bit about that. Luke, do you have um, anything you wanted to point out or ask about? To ask about, there was one question. Yeah, you, you mentioned um, how you pick if a note's going to be up high or down low. When you're looking at the chart, are you looking at, um, before you start, are you kind of looking at the range that the melody has to cover to inform where you're going to put things? Yes, that'll inform a number of things. It'll inform not only which string I put the melody note on, but it also informs what key I pick to do this thing in, right? So, so you know, if I want to have a very lush one chord, F is about the lowest, maybe E, right? To get that fifth on top with some color down below. So right now I've got a chord that's got seven and nine in it, right? If I were in the key of D, I wouldn't have that option because my low fifth is right here. Maybe I could put that down there or this. There's a few options, but it's not as many color options. So if you look at this sheet, which you're seeing hopefully right this minute, the, low, the first note is a, is a C that's quite low. And then if you scan the thing, you notice that the melody climbs from there and it peaks up to a high E in, in bars nine. And that might be the highest note in the whole piece. So the, the song has this as its lowest note and that as its highest note. So F works really well because it can get all of that stuff, right? If I decided to do it in B flat, I might have a very lush one chord and options thereof. But then when I go to here, I'm way up here for that last, right? And if I have a Telecaster, that's a beautiful range up there. But on this particular guitar, which is one of Ted Green's old guitars, by the way, um, it uh, it's a little bit high up. So I pick and choose based on that. But you can yeah scan the, the melody. Typically, guitar is sounds. What is it? It sounds an octave higher than it's written. Yeah. Um, so uh, so we don't live in ledger lines all of the time, and. Um, and so we usually, tra we, we basically transpose because when a piano player plays that, what they call middle C, it sounds like this. But when we play it, usually it sounds like this, right? When you read that one ledger line below the staff, treble clef, usually we think it's that. But um, I read it up an octave just so that it works because there's not much, <laughs> not much going on down here. And maybe I could do it. <laughs> not very interesting right uh, okay that's, hopefully that answers that so so just as like a starting place they might look at the tune and see the range that they've got to cover before even committing to a key before even starting to find voicings and right. then what they could do is what you've done here which is m mark out the intervals of each melody note for the chord in the moment yeah you might have to start doing that sort of really doing whatever the, the work is, however long it takes to, to indicate what the numbers are. Um, 
uh, so that you don't have to be thinking of it while you're trying to play, you know, and then you'll get better and better at it and you can do it more spontaneously. The other thing that I would say, Luke, is it's really, really important to learn the melody of a song independent of any chords. And if you're going to try and play it on um, as a solo guitar piece, you might want to learn the melody along the fingerboard, maybe on the top two or three strings. Or even... Right? Because then it get a nice, beautiful vocal quality. I'll, I'll preach a little bit about this uh, for just a second, of the importance of this. Very often I hear um, solo guitar players or chord melody guitar players who are playing chords that fit the song. And then very often I hear the melody being given less attention than I think that it wants and needs. After all, the melody is the song, not just the chord progression. The chord progression helps to define the melody, but the melody is the important thing. If I'm playing the chords to this, maybe an astute musician might know, oh, you're playing Autumn Leaves, I mean, a uh, Foggy Day. But my mom won't know that, right? Because the melody's not there and the, and the association is to the melody. So we learn the melody first or at least early on, so we can really sing it or hum it and really play it beautifully with all of the rests that are involved and held notes and you play it really beautifully. Because then when you go to add chords to it, the melody has its own um, quality and you have learned, uh, have a developed and learned some respect for the melody. Sometimes guitar players will give the melody a short change because it's inconvenient to play it against the chords that they know, <laughs> right? You know certain chords. Well, I know an A minor 7 flat 5. Well, it happens to be that the melody note is in that chord that I know. But what if I want to play it up here? Well, yeah, I can't really get that note unless I do some funny fingering. So I say learn the melody so that you cause yourself to be respectful of the melody and learn the voicings that you need to learn in order to play a good accompaniment to the actual melody instead of this sort of blowing off the hard notes because <laughs> that's it really is hap it, it does happen i hear a lot of you know solo guitar performances where the melody is sort of craftily reinvented so that it falls nicely on the guitar and sometimes you have to do that sometimes you might want to do that but don't do it in unintentionally you know don't do it because it's hard you know don't learn a melody okay <laughs> cool there's a, a couple of other things so the the other thing that i, I want to mention um just for people when they're working through the book is that you might be on one chord for multiple melody notes that doesn't mean you have to swap to another chapter in the book to find it for every melody note you can look on the page you're on and because we've listed out all the intervals in a chord you can find one voicing which has in its top two voices gives you the melody notes that you would need Yes, thank you very much for pointing that out. Um, there is an erroneous idea that oftentimes we have, and it makes people worried, and it makes people feel like it's a really hard thing to say, well, every note in that in that chord melody is supposed to have a chord on it, and and or a new chord. <laughs> well, this one, the reason I chose this tune is because it has repeated melody notes, and they, right? Now, you can do a simple version where you say, But you could also maybe play you know there's all kinds of extra things that you can do in the movement so you might be more inclined to recognize which voicings that have different bass notes but have the same melody note than uh, um, trying to harmonize every melody note um, you know, in a passage with a new chord. So very often, on, not in this song so much. Uh, well, for instance, uh, at the end of this song, there's a little line that goes. That's about the most active 
part of the song and it's just quarter notes and you could say voice an f with it this is um the second line from the bottom f with a c on top and then f with an f on, on top and then g with a g on top and then g with a b flat on top these are all just the simplest voicings possible but you could also say oh sorry and then i'm playing two melody notes which are in within reach of each other um, at, while I'm holding down one chord. I do that quite frequently, especially when I'm improvising. So I might improvise on this tune. All that happened on one fingering. There I changed chords a bunch of times. So you don't always have to have a chord under every melody note. You could play a whole passage of notes without any chordal support and then come and land on a nice chord. There's all kinds of ways to do it, which unfortunately are beyond the scope of this particular book. But, you know, this is more like kind of like life's work business, you know, so my master tome of, you know, uh, like George Van Epps wrote, the, you know, that many books. <laughs> you know, I'll get around to that eventually. But in, in, in terms of this particular book, the strength of it is if you're looking for maybe some variety of voicings to maybe spruce up a, an arrangement that you've already got that is a little bit flat, or if you're, and this isn't just for solo guitar, I should say, if I'm comping and I want to be able to play a melodic comp that doesn't, inf, um, you know, uh, clash with the melody, then I might be, uh, you'd be, find it very useful to, to look at that kind of thing too. Maybe something like this. One, two, three, four. A foggy day in London town had me low, it had me down. You know, I could do something like that. And those voicings are in there as well. So you're not looking for the melody note. You're looking for a note that's just below the melody note, maybe, or just above it. I did have one question that someone asked me, which was, why would I get this if I know how to work out my voicings already? And I'd like to know what your answer is, because I know what the answer to that is. But I'd be curious to see if you had one. Okay. Um, if you know how to do a simple chord melody by saying, okay, I need an F major seven with the fifth on top. Well, I already know how to do that. Um, the tendency might be that you'll do the same one you always do. I know that for me and for years, I would always go to my go-tos. And then because you're your main audience and you're playing solo guitar, you're the main listener, you might discover that you want to have some more variety. You might want to have some different color. You might want to um, you might be confused by uh, a particular situation that you only have one or two choices for. And if you open up the book, you might, you might discover that there's 10 or 15 choices for that harmonization with different bass notes or various things. Um, so I think that's probably why to somebody who is already well on their way to being able to make a solo guitar or comping um, type scenarios. The other thing I think which is really good is if you're a teacher and you want to give your student some some um, sort of specific and, and uh, helpful information, they might benefit from that as well. Instead of you having to write everyone out, you can just say, oh, that one's a good one or that one's a good one. What was your reason, Luke? So my reason is when I think of how I would create chords in the moment, it's dependent on either a system like a drop two system or a drop two and four system, something like that, or it's dependent on a scale shape around that region. And so many of these voicings are outside of, of those worlds. They would extend multiple positions that you wouldn't think of organically. You wouldn't have rehearsed a shape that would come up with these and they don't fit into the boxes of drop twos and drop threes. They're really colorful, you know, four or five note voicings. Yes. Um, so that's the other thing. You, you, they're the kinds of things that you, a lot of the time, they're from your experience and your expertise that right, right. can't just stumble on. Right. A lot of these are just my pets, you know. And 
Another thing I think it was important it's important to say is that if you see a chord and it's got five notes, I play with five fingers when I play. And if you only play with like a pick and two fingers, you might only want to have three note voicings. Well, you can trim these voicings down. You can still have the melody note you're looking for and you can you can play only two notes of the three or four that are underneath. And and uh, then you can write it th those in um, underneath in the blank ones just to, to catalog the discoveries that you're having. Um, and uh, I think that's also important. The other thing, and there's a there's a little video about this in the supplements. Uh, some of these chords are tricky. They have some tricky fingerings, and some of them may be unplayable for you based on your physical abilities. Um, you can always trim those chords down. So if you if you see a chord like this, I love this chord. This is a, a G7 sharp five sharp nine. It's kind of the cousin of this easier chord, you know. Uh, there it is. I went too. I went too far. Sorry. I'm. I'm. Okay. So this G7 and this G7 are kissing cousins. This one's a lot. Can be daunting, where this one just about everybody knows. And they they live next to each other in the book. They're within a couple of you know doors down. Um, uh, and uh, so feel free to trim this one down to this, right? Or maybe put a bass note in the bottom, or maybe this one. Uh, now that fingering right there is one of those weird ones, and I'm playing a note with my first fingertip. I'm fretting two notes, one fret below that over here, so I can get a, a B in, in the bottom of my G7 sharp five sharp five. <laughs> so there are some tricky ones, there are some weird ones, and, and explore them. Uh, we didn't indicate them at all, but if you ever see a note where you say to yourself, how the F did he do that? Or I don't have enough fingers to do that. That's one of these funny ones. <laughs> and yeah, there's videos on how to play some of those, as well as over maybe five hours now of additional videos of playthroughs, masterclasses. Um, that you get access to alongside the book. Awesome. I think that wraps it up. I think that's a great way of explaining how how to get uh, the most out of this book. Okay. Well, do your magic with uh, the editing, uh, Luke, and and so we can have the the pages of the book and all these kinds of things that, uh, zo zoomed in there. That would be great. Perfect. Yeah. I yeah. Just thank everybody once again. Uh, I, I, um, I hope you really enjoy the book and get a lot out of it. Thank you.